what we will do here in section four is look at methods transformations that allow you to go from the Laplace S domain to the Z domain. So why would you uh, need to go from the S domain to the Z domain? Well, a first re reason is that you're given a transfer function in the S domain, so a continuous time description of the system, but you would like to do your design directly in the Z domain. So you need a description of the system that takes into account the zero order holds. This is because you want a TS here. Well, that is not very, very small compared to the main time constant. So that you have to take into account this zero order hold that introduces a delay of TS over two, right? And based on this Z description of the process, you're going to design a C of Z. To go from here to here, you need a method that takes into account the zero order hold mechanism. And this will be this method over here. Okay. We'll see this later. So this is a, a TS that well, is large. Uh, it, it, well, it's still small with respect to the main time constant, but it's much larger than the one that we're going to consider in this second reason why we would like to go from the S domain to the Z domain. Well, if you have done a design directly in the S domain, as you have done in last year's course of fundamentals of control theory, and you would like to implement this controller on a processor, well, you'll have to discretize and go to the Z domain in order to have this description that you can implement on a processor. So you need a discretization step and the methods that you're going to use are the ones that are over here. Okay, don't use this one because this is taking into account the zero order hold mechanism. And here, it, this is not needed anyway. This is going to be used for TS, well, much smaller than the main time constant. The four last methods are numerical integration or numerical approximation methods. The three other methods are methods that, well, impose a certain constraint and that allow you to obtain then a transformation method from the S to the Z domain. So this impulse invariance method, for instance, makes sure that the impulse response in continuous time and in discrete time are the same at the sampling instance. You have something similar for the step invariance method, but of course for the step response, and it can be shown that this method is equivalent to the zero order hold method, which makes sure that the impulse responses in continuous and discrete time coincide, but taking into account the zero order hold mechanism. This third method here matches the poles and zeros in the Z and S domain using this relation. Z is the exponential of TSS. And it makes sure that the DC gain is the same for the transfer function in S and the transfer function in Z. Before we go any further, we return to this relation. Z is the exponential of TSS. And it is a relation that maps the Laplace S plane in the Z plane. And it's also a review of something that we have seen in last year's course, Signals and Systems. The S domain and the Z domain are linked by the relation Z is equal to the exponential of TS times S. And if you look at this connection and replace S by sigma plus J omega, you can rewrite Z as follows. 
and this will be r and this can be rewritten as the exponential of j omega right so we've kind of gone from a variable s expressed as a complex number but in cartesian form to a z that is expressed in polar coordinates so r will be the radius and you can see here that r will be positive and it will be well in between zero and infinity the angle here capital omega is the discrete frequency it's linked to the frequency in the laplace domain that is in radians per second so you can see that you have radians per second times second so the discrete frequency will be expressed in radians observe also that the variable r is only linked to the damping factor sigma the relation between the s plane and the z plane is obtained from this relation if you plug in s is equal to sigma plus j omega in here we have seen that you can write z as r exponential of j omega so it's a complex variable in polar form where r is the radius and it's defined like so it depends on the sampling period and on the damping coefficient sigma and the discrete frequency omega is linked to the analog frequency omega times ts so omega has units radians per second this means that the discrete frequency will have units radiant radians per second times second see also here that r is equal to the modulus of z and that omega is equal to the argument of z we'll now have a look at the radius r or the modulus of z as a function of sigma the damping parameter in the s domain you can see that when sigma is negative you'll have the exponential of a negative number so the radius the modulus will be smaller than one if you plug in sigma is equal to zero over here you'll have the exponential of zero which is one so sigma is equal to zero will correspond to a radius of one and a modulus of one so you can kind of see that the j omega axis is mapped onto the unit circle modulus of z is equal to one if you plug in a positive value over here the exponential so the radius will be larger than one what we'll do now is look at the link between the discrete frequencies and the analog frequencies and we therefore have to consider this relation over here this is the discrete frequency and here we have the analog frequency remember that z is r exponential of j omega and the discrete frequency omega is also the argument of z right so what we want to do here is consider the entire z plane so we can do this by considering a discrete frequency or the argument of z in between minus pi and pi and taking the radius positive or zero so in this way we have selected the whole z plane let us now look at the equivalent analog frequencies and by looking at this equation you can see that if you take this interval and you divide by ts 
you obtain the equivalent interval for the analog frequencies. So omega ranges from minus pi over ts to pi over ts. So it ranges from minus the Nyquist frequency to the Nyquist frequency. So you can see here that in the S domain, we have kind of a central strip here of width 2 pi over ts. And this central strip is mapped on the entire Z plane. What we can do right now is consider an equivalent interval that is given over here that is shifted by 2k pi where k is an integer okay and you can kind of see that this interval is equivalent to the interval that we have considered before in the sense that will again generate the whole complete z plane if we now look at the equivalent analog frequencies and looking at this equation we have to divide by ts and we find the interval the corresponding interval for the analog frequencies and you can see that at least when k is different from zero will define strips of width 2 pi over ts that will be different to the strip that we had already considered before okay so you can kind of see see here that the s domain is decomposed in strips of width 2 pi over ts and that each of these strips is mapped on the entire z plane we have seen in the previous slide that strips of width 2 pi over ts that cover the left and right half planes of the Laplace domain are mapped into the entirety of the Z plane. The width of such strips is of course related to the Nyquist condition. This condition says that when you sample analog signals, the frequency content should not go above the maximum frequency omega n, which is the Nyquist frequency pi over ts where ts is of course the sampling period when the sample period tends to zero the width of the strip will tend to infinity and in the limit this central strip will cover the whole left and right half planes of the laplace domain let us look at this in a visual way. Remember that the relation between the Z domain and the S domain is given by this relation. If you plug in S is equal to sigma plus J omega, you should know by now that you can find that Z can be written as a complex number under polar form where R is the exponential of ts sigma and where the discrete frequency omega is related to the analog frequency omega by this relation over here so what we'll do is first do what we've done in the previous slide and look at things more visually so what we'll do is select this discrete frequency in the interval pi minus pi or minus pi pi and we'll consider in general that r is positive or zero so if we have a look at the corresponding analog frequencies we have to divide by ts so we see that omega the analog frequency is in between minus pi over ts and pi over ts right and if you look at it in the s plane well you can see this as a strip this is this central strip of width well the width here is 2 pi over ts 
right? So the entirety of this strip of width 2 pi over ts is mapped to the entirety of the z plane. So what we'll do right now is, and this is what you see here in gray, look at this half strip of width 2 pi over ts and we'll first have a look at the half strip that corresponds to sigma smaller than zero. Well if sigma is smaller than zero you can see from this relation over here that this will be corresponding to r smaller than one and this is what is here indicated in gray this half strip to the left of the j omega axis is mapped to the inside of the unit circle so now we can also have a look at what happens and i'll change color here when sigma is larger than zero well you can see from the same relation that this will correspond to r larger than one so this strip this half strip to the right of the j omega axis will be mapped to the region that is outside the circle modulus of z is equal to one right and what we can do now is have a look at what happens when sigma is equal to zero and sigma is equal to zero is that part of the half strip that is on the j omega axis and if you start from this point over here uh, that corresponds to a analog frequency of minus pi over ts you start over here at minus pi right and you go from here to here what you will do is travel on the unit circle until you've reached a discrete frequency of pi okay and you go from c to b on the unit circle so what we can do now is take an other interval for the discrete frequency let us take an interval pi 3 pi and remember that the discrete frequency is the analog frequency times ts we'll do choose here again r is larger or equal to zero so this corresponds to any value of sigma remember that r is exponential of ts sigma so this corresponds to negative and positive values of sigma and you see that this radius of course is always positive or zero so what are the equivalent analog frequencies you have to take this relation and divide by ts and you see that the analog frequencies are in the range pi over ts and 3 pi over ts and we consider all values of sigma okay so we can kind of see that we consider strips where the analog frequencies are in between pi over ts and 3 pi over ts and see that this is a different strip than the one that we had considered in the previous slide but it's also a strip of width 2 pi over ts and this whole strip okay left part and right part is mapped on the entire z plane so if we consider sigma smaller than zero if we look at this relation over here we see that r is going to be smaller than one so the half uh, 
strip to the left of the j omega axis is going to be mapped inside the unit circle and this is what is shown here in gray we can again have a look at what's happening when sigma is larger than zero obviously we'll have r larger than one so this half strip to the right of the j omega axis will be mapped to the region outside the unit circle and again what we can do is look at what's happening on the j omega axis remember that we're considering frequencies that range from pi over ts up to 3 pi over ts so what's happening is that we're moving on the j omega axis as is shown over here and that the corresponding discrete frequencies will range from pi to 3 pi so we start over here with a discrete frequency of pi and then we move and so this corresponds to the point c by the way and then we move on the unit circle and here we have moved to 2 pi okay so this corresponds to this point over here and if we continue well we'll end up in a discrete frequency 3 pi and this corresponds to the point b but in the z domain b and c they correspond and they are the same value z so i think that you understand things by now so here you have another interval for the analog frequency you go from minus 3 pi over ts up to pi, minus pi over ts so this corresponds to discrete frequencies from minus 3 pi up to minus pi and here we have sigma smaller than zero since we have r is equal to e ts sigma so this will correspond to the region r is smaller than one so again this left half strip uh, left of the j omega axis will be mapped inside the unit circle so here we consider analog frequencies and this is this central strip in between minus pi over ts pi over ts so the discrete frequency will range in between minus pi and pi and here we consider sigma larger than zero remember that r is e to the ts sigma so this will correspond to r larger that one so this central strip and we have seen this previously to the right of the j omega axis is moved to the region outside the unit circle we have seen that all these half strips to the left of the j omega axis are all mapped to the inside of the unit circle we have also seen that portions of the j omega axis here going from minus pi over ts to pi over ts well this portion of the j omega axis is mapped on the unit circle you have to take the discrete variable and go from minus pi to pi this is also the case for this portion of the j omega axis it goes from a frequency an analog frequency of pi over ts to the frequency 3 pi over ts and again it is mapped on the unit circle the discrete variable comes from pi to 3 pi and 
I guess you can start to understand now we have that this portion that corresponds to the analog frequency minus 3 pi over ts to minus pi over ts well it's also mapped on the unit circle the discrete frequency goes from minus 3 pi to minus pi we can now make the link with the sampling theorem of section 6 well, if we're going to consider a spectra of signal, we need to compute the Fourier transform of a signal f of t. This is f of j omega. And remember that if sigma is in the domain of convergence of the Laplace transform f of s, we can simply use the Laplace transform and replace s by j omega but what is important is that we have to work on the j omega axis to, cons to consider spectra the nyquist frequency says that the signals that we are going to consider must be band limited this, this means that they have well support in between minus pi over ts pi over ts and minus pi over ts is minus the nyquist frequency and this is the nyquist frequency so why do we need this condition well we have just seen that this different portions here you have here j3 pi over ts minus j3 pi over ts this different portions over here of the j omega axis they will all be mapped on the unit circle so if this condition is not met these different portions are going to overlap after sampling in the z domain and this is going to cause aliasing or frequency folding so we need this nyquist condition so what will happen after mapping to the z plane well this spectrum on the j omega axis and this well region of interest over here will be mapped to the modulus of z is equal to r is equal to 1 and this analog frequency in this range will be mapped to the discrete frequency in between minus pi and pi and if we meet the nyquist condition and this signal f of t is band limited then when we'll go around the unit circle in the z plane here the mapped frequency response the mapped spectrum will repeat itself periodically and this is precisely what we had seen about the spectrum of the sample signal in section two this is kind of a small summary so we consider here omega that are in between minus pi over ts and pi over ts this is the relation and this yields well r is equal to the exponential of sigma ts and well the discrete frequency is related to omega expressed in radians per second times ts right so here we go from minus p ts to pi ts sorry to pi ts sigma is equal to zero okay so we start from uh, going starting from here r will be one so you're living on the unit circle and you start from minus pi and you keep on going this way and you end up in b right and because of the periodic nature here in the z domain b and c coincide if you do the same 
but with a sigma that is smaller than zero well you do the same we'll do the same trajectory but on a circle of a radius smaller than one right so what you see over here is that omega and this blue line here omega is zero okay so this uh, is the frequency here the analog frequency so the discrete frequency will be zero as well and if you go this way the radius is going to become smaller and smaller so you're going this way right and well if you go and you start from this point over here you know that the analog frequency is pi over ts so the discrete frequency will be pi so you're over here and here going this way the radius will decrease if you do this thing over here you do the same so the radius will decrease but you start from minus pi these two points coincide again by the what well, the fact that in the z domain everything becomes periodic okay and these are lines of iso damping same damping so this angle here over here is the arc sign of the damping factor we'll come back to this when we consider performance in the s domain and in the z domain and we will see later that this these lines over here will be mapped to these lines over here in the z domain so what we'll do now is have a look at the pole location under sampling and we'll use an example but the conclusion that we can draw on this example is true in general so we start from the causal signal exponential of minus a t u of t and a is positive you remember or you should remember or should be able to find that the laplace transform of this signal is 1 over s plus a so the pole is located in minus a if we now sample this sequence we simply replace t by kts we obtain this discrete time sequence that you can rewrite as follows and now you can obtain the z transform okay so what we have here is z over z minus this quantity over here so the pole is in discrete time exponential of minus a t s so what you can conclude is that from this example and it is true in general that the discrete time pole is obtained from the continuous time pole by the relation exponential times the continuous time pole times t s right so we can say that in general sampling maps the s domain poles to the z domain via the same relation that we have already considered before before we look at zeros and resampling we should have a look at the pole excess of a transfer function and the zeros at infinity so we'll take an example ps here is t3s plus 1 t1s plus 1 squared t2s plus 1 so the pole excess here is 2 so d here is equal to 2 in this case so you can see here that if s is tending to plus or minus infinity well ps will tend to zero so you can view these as zeros of the transfer function we are going to consider zeros at infinity but it's an s tending to minus infinity because you need to take s that are in the region of convergence so now we talk about zeros and resampling and in general it is not possible to give a simple 
formula for mapping of zeros between s and z domain but you can say that if ts is small okay so when ts is tending to zero then the zeros in the s domain can be mapped to the ones in the z domain via the same relation z is the exponential of tss the zeros at infinity in the s domain okay that we've just discussed should not be overlooked okay in this case for instance there are two zeros at infinity right and they will be mapped using this relation here to zeros at the origin okay so if you take s is minus infinity or s tending to minus infinity you will see that the transfer function will have a zero at the origin and we'll illustrate this now so let us consider an example with zeros and sampling. So we'll consider the following causal sequence, a cosine multiplied by u of t to make it causal. So the Laplace transform can easily be obtained. And this is something that you can do because you have followed last year's course of signals and systems. And here in the S domain, you have two poles p1 p2 and they're equal to plus minus j omega zero you have a zero at the origin and you have another zero that tends to minus infinity we take minus infinity because the zero has to be in the domain of convergence so what we do now is sample the sequence you obtain this sequence over here previously in the course we have considered a sequence r 0 k cosine of omega 0 k plus phi u of k and we have computed the z transform so consider that sequence and replace r 0 by 1 phi by 0 and the discrete frequency omega zero capital omega zero is omega zero ts and you end up with this z transform so you can see here that in the z domain the poles are exponential right of plus minus j omega zero ts Okay, so indeed you see that there is a way to go from the S domain poles to the Z domain poles, and this is by using this relation over here, right? This is true for the poles, and what we can do now also is have a look for the zeros. So we have a zero at cosine omega zero ts right we'll call it z1 here and z2 is a zero at the origin right and you can see here and i'll draw it in blue that indeed you can use the same relationship to go from the s domain zeros to the z domain zeros but this is only true when ts is going to tend to zero right when ts is tending to zero you'll have here a zero that will become one okay and indeed this zero is going to be mapped to this zero by this relation and the zero at infinity is going to be mapped at a zero at the origin but again this is only true when ts is becoming small well the choice of the sampling interval the sampling period is very important so these are two slides here there are only two that speak about the sampling period but they take a very important place in this course right so up front what we have to say also is of course that 
we have sampled the signals in such a way that we obey the sampling theorem that we've seen in section two. So this means that before sampling, we have removed all components above the Nyquist frequency by using a low pass anti-aliasing filter. If we choose the sampling frequency too low, this means that TS, the sampling period, is chosen too large. Then we lose too much information and it's difficult to construct a controller that will have a good control performance. Okay, This is because the dynamics of the system are not modeled well, they are kind of lost. Well, if the sampling rate, the sampling frequency is too high, this means that TS is too small, right? And in this case, well, this will increase the computational burden of the processor because you have to do updates in your control action much too often. What will happen also is that, of course, since TS is so small, the output will be very similar to the previous output, okay? And what you will add or correct will become very, very small, and this will lead to bad numerical properties if TS is really too small. If you look at the literature, and try to find which sampling period you should use, you will find that there are many answers. And these answers look very different, but in the end, if you look at it closely, you will see that the results are very similar. So the first result is for damped systems, okay? And TS is computed as a function of the rise time of the system. So the rise time is what well, can be read, for instance, from the step response. We'll assume that the step response here, for instance, looks like this. This is the step response. And the rise time is the time that you need to go from 10% of the same percent here. 10% of the final response, so this will be here 100%, and here we'll have 90%. So the rise time is the time that you need to go from a response that is 10% of the final response to a response that is 90% of the final response. So this is the rise time. Well, this rule here, it's well, these are all rule of thumbs. This rule of thumb tells you that TS should be chosen as follows. It's the rise time divided by N, where N ranges from four to 10, right? If you take 10, then you have the smallest sampling period. And if you take four, well, you have kind of the maximum sampling period according to this rule. Well, the previous relation was for damped systems. Here we have a rule of thumb that you can find in the literature for second order oscillatory systems. So systems that are characterized by a natural frequency and a damping factor. Those are systems that you have considered last year in the course of fundamentals of control theory. Well, this rule of thumb tells you that you should choose omega n ts, so the natural frequency times the sample sampling period in the range 0.2 to 0.6. This omega n ts can be seen as the discrete natural frequency. Okay, so why do we write it like this? Well, this allows you to kind of normalize this range. For TS, of course, you will have to divide this range by omega n. 
This looks very different to what you see over here, but we'll see later that the rise time for that kind of systems can be approximated by 1.8 over omega n. So if you take this rule here, knowing that here the rise time is given by this formula, you would have Ts in the range, right? 1.8 divided by omega n and then divided by the largest one and 10 up to 1.8 divided by omega n divided by the smallest one over here four okay and this is of course equivalent of having omega n ts in the range well 0 0.18 right and 0 0.45 okay so this is telling you that this n is equal to four is a bit too low for this type of systems but it gives you results that is that are very similar to what you see over here so really those two rules are certainly not contradictory on the contrary they tell you the same thing well another reasonable bound that you find in the literature and by reasonable we mean a small enough ts is given by this relation over here actually this relation because this one is equivalent and as you can see here the sampling frequency is linked to the bandwidth of the system so what we need to do is well, look at this bandwidth of the system and link it to the natural frequency well what we can look at is the magnitude plot in db of the Bode diagram of a second order oscillatory system and purely indicative but it will look like this right and somewhere in this vicinity we have the natural frequency and the bandwidth frequency is the bandwidth at which the gain is minus 3 db so you can see that the natural frequency and the bandwidth frequency are in the same order of magnitude but of course the bandwidth frequency is larger than the natural frequency and what we'll do is write it simply as k times the natural frequency with of course k larger than one but not that much larger than one so what we'll do is take this relation over here omega n natural frequency times ts is equal to 0.2 to show that this is well, more or less equivalent to what you see over here and that you have here an under bound right we multiply by k and we do this of course because in this fashion we have here the bandwidth frequency well 2 pi times the bandwidth frequency in hertz is of course the bandwidth frequency expressed in radians per second so what we'll do is 2 pi times fb this is this one over here right we will divide by this one and we'll divide on both sides also by ts so we have 1 over ts and this is because we want here of course the sampling frequency and as you can see this is 10 pi over k times the bandwidth frequency right and this can be seen to be in the neighborhood of 20 to have 20 exactly you would need k is equal to 
pi over 2 right which is larger than 1 so this is certainly consistent with what we see over here anyway we can see that fs is approximately 20 times the bandwidth frequency is consistent with this underbound over here well as i've said the choice of the sampling interval is very important and you can choose one of these three methods to determine its value in this course we are going to take the zero order hold mechanism into account when we design the controller so we have a tendency of taking ts larger than advocated in these rules well of course you cannot push it too far so you cannot choose ts too large because don't forget that in between sampling instance the process is running in open loop so a perturbation a disturbance is only seen at the sampling instance if the sampling period becomes too large well you lose time before you actually see the perturbation the disturbance also if you choose your sampling period too high it will take some time before some control actions such as taking the controller in manual mode will be taken into account in the associated digital control lab you will have to choose the sampling period and of course take it as far as possible take your ts as large as possible but remember that there is this trade-off if you choose it too large well the period of time where your process is going to run in open loop will be too large and you will not be able to react to disturbances fast enough